fast. You good? You need white balance? Well, good afternoon. So just now on the floor, Republicans once again kept their promise to fully fund our veterans, the military readiness, and their well-being. Once again, we found the Democrats voting against our veterans. First with the NDAA on a pay raise, and now with the veterans and the military readiness. I don't understand what is up with the Democrats of why they continue to vote against our veterans. More good news today, though. The Supreme Court agreed with the House that the Mountain Valley Pipeline can and should be built. That's good news and the right call for the American workers and helping to make America energy independent. I know you in this room, for the last 201 days, I can know what day of the week it is based upon the questions that you ask. I begin to refer to them as the five stages of the DC press cycle of doubt. When I come in on Monday, the number one question you ask me is not about policy, but can we pass it? That's your doubting stage. When we get to Tuesday, you become despaired. You insist that we will not be able to pass the bill. The next is we deliver, just like today. We pass it. But what's interesting is your next step that you go to is downplay. The day before and the doubt and despair of how great of the challenge it will to be my speakership, after we pass it, the downplay, you say, well, that really wasn't a big deal. Then the final stage is your disappointment. You're sad that we continue to keep our promises to the American public. You keep hoping to write that bill that somehow we have failed or somehow we have given up. The good news is we will never give up on the American people. We made a commitment to them, and we continue to keep it time and again. You know, we will depart a little later today, and it would be responsible to look at what has this new Congress been able to accomplish. I've read your stories about a five-seat majority. I've read your stories time and again about the president threatening the veto. I read your stories that why do you pass this, even try to pass this bill? Because the Senate will never take it up. What's interesting is, this is a whole new house. You see members, they now show up for work. You see bills, they actually have to go through committee. And what has been the outcome? Well, we have passed more rule bills, 50, and sent more bills to the president's desk than the Democrats did with the Majority in the House, the Senate, and the Presidency. I look forward to reading those stories, too. The real truth is, we keep our commitment to America. We said the things that we would do in the first little bit. Yes, we voted to fire Biden's army of 87,000 IRS agents. And then in the debt ceiling, we made sure not one dollar would be able to spend this year and took another 20 billion, and we'll get the rest later. We ended the COVID emergency. We created a bipartisan select committee on China. We passed the Parents' Bill of Rights so parents can have a say in their kids' education. We passed the strongest border security bill this country has ever seen. We passed the largest spending cuts in American history without any new taxes. And we passed the first permitting reform in more than 40 years. We passed new work requirements for welfare that will lift people out of poverty. We passed the largest pay raise for our service members in decades, and the Democrats voted against it. And every day, we're working to hold the Biden administration accountable. We're watching that success as well. If there's one thing I hope you've learned about this new Republican majority, it's not just a Republican majority. It's an American majority. This is now the people's house where they can participate. Bills now have the opportunity not only to be seen and read and go through committee. Members show up to work, and most importantly, we show up to work for the American people, and we will never give up on the American people themselves. With that, I'd like to introduce our majority leader, who has worked very hard on getting these bills to the floor and making it all happen, Steve Scalise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as they keep doubting, Mr. Speaker, you and our conference will keep delivering. 
It's great to be back in this room where earlier today we welcomed Italian Prime Minister Maloney. Uh, she's a real up and coming and very charismatic new leader of the country of my great great grandparents and so many of ours, the speaker, our conference chair, all have descendants that come from Italy and uh, we talked about our shared values. We talked about a number of things our two countries are working on together with our allies, especially in Europe. And so it was great to have her here. I know she's meeting with the president later today. Uh, if you look over these last seven months, this has been an incredibly busy but productive Congress. You know, we ran on our commitment to America. And when we ran, we said if we get the majority, we'll actually deliver those commitments to the American people. And one by one by one, we continued to do that. Uh, we passed the Lower Energy Costs Act. We passed the Securing the Borders Act. Uh, we've worked on bills to lower inflation, to push back on the radical far left extreme agenda of the Biden administration, to give a parent, parents a parent's bill of rights, uh, to focus our military again on our enemies, and especially on the threat that China poses instead of the attacks they're making from within, the problems they're creating that have caused a dramatic drop in recruiting. Uh, we have continued to deliver and today is no different. Having this important bill, the military construction and VA bill pass, is very important because the committees have been doing their work. Appropriations Committee has passed almost every bill out of committee. The Senate Committee has finally taken up work too. This goes back to the beginning of the Congress when the Speaker made it clear we're not going to do omnibus appropriations bills. And you had seen a pattern for years where the Senate just wouldn't take up appropriations bills. Well, that's changed because we made it clear we were not going to continue those kind of irresponsible actions in the House. And so it's pushed the Senate to work. But they still haven't passed any appropriations bills out of the Senate. And this bill is incredibly important because it funds veterans' health benefits. It funds better housing for our military veterans. It was incredibly disappointed that a bill that's that important to the men and women who sacrificed so much for our nations to give us the freedoms that we have today, that every single Democrat voted against veterans' health care, against the new housing for so many of our men and women in uniform who need and deserve it. But we still moved forward. We still said we're going to get the job done because it's that important. And as Democrats have walked away on so many important votes, Republicans have still stood up and fought for the American people to try to get this country back on track, to push against the extremist agenda. Uh, and it's not going to slow down. Uh, I do think it was uh, important that if you go back and look a few months ago, President Biden's VA Department of Public Affairs was spreading false information. They actually said that Republicans would cut health care benefits to veterans. It was a lie. We pointed it out at the time, and they continued to spread that lie. Well, that's not the job they're supposed to be doing. And if their mission is so focused on lying and hyperpartisan politics, not helping our veterans, we actually cut funding out of the Public Affairs Department and put it into increased funding for our men and women in uniform. That was also in this bill. So we're going to continue to fight for our men and women in uniform. We're going to continue to fight to get our job done. And the man who helps deliver the votes to do just that is our whip. Mr. Emmer. Thank you, Steve. Tested and proven. That has been the theme of our House, major House Republican majority over the last six months. Remember during the speaker's race when the talking heads here in Washington said things like, these Republicans can't even run a one-car parade. How are they going to govern? I'm proud to stand here alongside my colleagues today and say that under Speaker Kevin McCarthy's leadership, we've proved them all wrong over and over again. Our majority has come a long way as a team over the last six months, and that growth has produced a long list of promises kept for the American people. Whether it was bipartisan energy legislation that lowers costs for families, or a comprehensive border security bill for the first time in 20 years, or a debt ceiling bill that no one, no one believed we could pass, or the NDAA, which gives our service members the largest pay increase in two decades. 
House Republicans just keep delivering common sense pieces of legislation that protect and improve the lives of hardworking Americans. With a track record like that, it's no wonder Democrats are being forced to come along with us as we govern. These are incredible stats, by the way, from a razor-thin majority and a first-term speaker who only controls one-half of one-third of the government. As we spend time in our home districts over the next month, we're going to have a lot of important wins to discuss with our constituents. But our job is far from over. There's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to things like reining in Washington's reckless spending, holding the Biden administration accountable, and improving the lives of everyday Americans. We'll continue to listen to our constituents while we're at home, and we'll be ready to come back in September and continue our streak of defying expectations and delivering on our promises for the American people. And with that, I turn it over to our conference chair, Elise Stefanik. Thank you, Tom. When Republicans earned this majority just last year, our country was in crisis because of single-party Democrat rule under Joe Biden's leadership. But despite expectations, House Republicans have hit the ground running, working on behalf of the American people to deliver on our commitment to America, to combat the multitude of crises ravaging our country. And we focused on four major pillars, an economy that's strong, a nation that's safe, a future that's built on freedom, and a government that's accountable to we the people. And despite being underestimated every single day, every single week, I see you all at the press conferences, we have delivered real results for the American people and provided a critical check and critical oversight on Joe Biden and his administration. As the speaker mentioned, we reopened the People's House, ended the COVID-19 national emergency, passed HR1, the Lower Energy Cost Act, passed HR2, the Secure the Border Act, the strongest border security bill in the history of Congress. And particularly as a new mom and a member of the Education Committee, I'm so proud that we passed the Parents' Bill of Rights. In addition, we passed a national defense bill. As the representative for Fort Drum and the 10th Mountain Division, that pay increase, that investment in our troops is so critical. Critical, and it is shameful that the vast majority of Democrats voted no. And of course, we passed significant funding for our veterans today. And with each passing day, House Republicans conduct rigorous oversight. And under the leadership of the Speaker, as well as our committee chairs, Chairman Jordan, Chairman Smith, who's here today, and Chairman Comer, we continue to uncover more and more evidence linking President Biden to his family's illegal influence peddling scheme and the weaponized DOJ cover-up, pushing the White House to this past two weeks publicly change their position on the president's role in his son's foreign business dealings. Accountability is here and House Republicans are leading the way. The dedication and discipline of my colleagues that stand with me today and the whole of this House Republican majority, we are proud to have delivered these real results and we will continue to be lasered focused on delivering wins for the American people. And we are just getting started. And with that, I want to highlight one of our freshman members who has been a tremendous addition to our conference, Representative Nathaniel Moran from Texas. Thank you uh, for that introduction. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak in particular about our commitment to make sure that government remains accountable. The foundation of accountability is transparency. The result of accountability is trust. And frankly, we have not seen transparency out of the Biden administration. And as a result of that, we do not see trust from the American people in our government. That needs to change. We in the Republican uh, conference in the House of Representatives are dedicated and committed to seeing that government is accountable. And we are dedicated to make sure that this government remains transparent so that the American people can trust what is happening here. And frankly, I'm proud to be part of a team whose leadership abides by the principles of never quit and no excuses. And you see that in the seven months that we've uh, been in charge of this, uh, this House of Representatives, so much has been done to bring government to account. I serve on judiciary, education, workforce, and foreign affairs, and almost all of our hearings have been dominated by the fact that we have to hold our government accountable in the executive branch. 
We would love it if it were not so, but it is so because they refuse to be transparent. Whether or not it's because of the lack of transparency or the unwillingness to follow the same rules that they impede and they impart on the American uh, public or the fact that they move the goalpost and create different rules for themselves over and over again for those who are loyal to the Biden administration and to the leftist agenda that they're pushing. It's inconceivable that it's happen happening here in America. Just in the last month, uh, in those three committees that I, I've serve, served on, We've seen a number of examples where Biden administration officials have gone out of their way to make sure that they do not show transparency in what's going on. Just a couple weeks ago, I asked questions of Secretary, former Secretary Kerry, now climate czar Kerry, trying to figure out questions as simple as, who's on your staff? And he won't answer. Or where are you setting the priorities in your discussions with the CCP. And instead of answering those questions directly, he defended the CCP and Communist China and defended the climate policies that are burdening American businesses day in and day out. And then you look, back, look at Secretary Mayorkas and what he did this week in judiciary, refusing to answer several questions and refusing to admit that there was loss of operational control at the border refusing to give any indication about how many of the millions of individuals that have come over the border in the past couple of years under the Biden administration have now actually gone through an adjudication process and been sent back to their homeland, refusing to give answers, dodging every question he could because he did not want to remain accountable. FBI Director Christopher Wray, just a few weeks ago in judiciary, wouldn't answer questions about why the, the Department of Justice has been weaponized against American, the American public and why they are living by a two-tier system of justice, one for the Biden administration and those who would follow his principles, and one for the rest of us in America. I also serve on the subcommittee on responsiveness and accountability to oversight. And our job under that, under that subcommittee is to pursue the government agencies that won't give us documents. We are a Congress. We are the voice of the American people. We are supposed to look out for their interests. They have asked us to hold government accountable. And when we ask for documents, you know what happens? They don't. And when they give us documents, you know what happens? They're redacted. And we've seen it time and time again throughout our hearings this past seven months. Our commitment to America remains strong. Our commitment to a government that is accountable. We will not be deterred. We will not relent. We demand on behalf of the American public a government that is accountable, and we will have it. Now, I'd like to introduce Congressman from Arizona, Mr. Juan Siscomani. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to thank uh, Speaker McCarthy and the whole leadership of the conference for these amazing seven months as I've started my journey in Congress. Every time people ask me, you know, how's it going? It's, it's, it's going. It's fast, and we've been making a lot of progress, and I'm very happy about that. Also, can say that I'm not happy about going home today. It's always good news, and uh, for me, going home keeps me informed, keeps me connected, and it keeps me married as well. So that's <laughs> always a good, a good thing to do. But I, I, I'm proud of the work that we've done. I'm proud of the work that we've delivered as a conference. We all ran on different promises, and in my case was one of economic opportunity, the freedom to pursue the American dream in the way that we are safe, and we can continue to keep our commitment to keep our community safe, and that is what I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about today. Uh, my border is a border district, as you know, in southeastern Arizona, and border security is a big piece of our daily lives. And the relationship with Mexico specifically is a big piece of our daily lives. I was born in Mexico, and I immigrated to the United States when I was 11 years old. Became a United States citizen in 2006, and was elected to Congress in 2022. This is the land of opportunity, no question about it. Nowhere else in the world could we have this kind of story and opportunity. With it comes the rule of law, though. With it comes responsibility to protect our borders from those trying to do harm to us. And there's a lot of cartel activity that you know about. And they've been dominating the traffic on the border, the illegal traffic, for a long time. That is hurting the positive bicultural uh, and also trade relationship that we've had with Mexico for so long, who is our ally and our friend. 
but these cartels and this illegal activity have taken over the trafficking of both drugs and, and, and women and children and, and overall people across this, and that must be stopped. And that's exactly one of the pillars of my campaign when I ran for office, and of course that was a pillar of what we had to do when we set out the plan to uh, our commitment to America. So with that, I want to just say that uh, we are keeping our commitment to America by delivering on, on, the, on a safe nation, and with that came HR2. This was a, a bill that, that it seems now that it was passed a long time ago and may seem that way because of all that we've done in between, but this is an important piece of legislation that highlighted the priorities that we have both to secure the border and add resources to that and also reform loops and gaps within the asylum system that has been so heavily abused also while protecting unaccompanied children. That was a big point for me and that was something that, that I have to give a lot of credit to the leadership for giving me a seat at the table as a freshman, as someone that wasn't in any of the committees that were moving these bills forward, but I still had a real seat at the table. It, being able to give our thoughts and opinions, both my personal experience and also my professional experience working on the border. So I am proud of the bill that we put forward. Uh, also, I've been uh, assigned to the task force on the, on the, on the cartel task force. This is, we've been meeting for a couple of weeks now, getting expert advice, and uh, we're going to be setting out a plan as we look deeper into the cartel activities and how legislation from Congress can help tackle that problem as well. The efforts around fentanyl can be uh, overstated. We've, we've said this before that every border has become a border state due to the fentanyl crisis. My home county of Pima County now is the home for the leading cost of death among young people being fentanyl overdose deaths. That is tragic, that has surpassed now car accidents, and, and unfortunately there hasn't been a positive curve on that uh, yet because of this administration's failure to tackle the real problem, both secure the border and tackle the problem regarding the cartels. Also providing strong support to our military, my district is home to over 70,000 veterans. That's the ninth largest veteran population in the country in terms of congressional districts. And I'm proud to represent two, two military bases and DM Air Force Base and Fort Huachuca. And like I said, 70,000 veterans living in our community that we've been able to uh, advocate for as a member of the Veteran Affairs Committee as well. Uh, and then as uh, the leader and others have mentioned today, passing the Military Construction and Veteran Affairs Package, very proud of this one, uh, proud of uh, the, what we've been able to do and hold the line and the funding for our veterans, but also up it even more and make sure that they have all the needs that they, that they need. Also, uh, correcting the record on whatever lies were said about our efforts or our intent to cut anything on veterans. That's absolutely not the case, and we proved that by making this the first appropriations bill. And speaking of appropriations, I am proud to be appointed to the Appropriations Committee and serve on that this entire time as the only freshman in this class to be able to do that, the only member in the Arizona delegation. And I want to thank the leadership, uh, Speaker McCarthy and, and, and Leader Scalise and, and uh, Tom and, and just everyone, Stephanie, everyone, because they've given me that opportunity to be on there and represent and carry the voice of our freshman class in the appropriations process. As I said, we're heading all back home today, proud of the work that we've done, but knowing that there's a lot of work to be done. And the time at home, it's a work period where we get to go and, and talk to people and listen even more. And, um, and, 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 you know, the only way you can actually be happy to go back to 115 degree weather is to be leaving 100 degree humid weather here in D.C. So with that, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I would like to turn it over to my friend, Representative Marionette Miller Beeks. Well, thank you very much, Representative Siskamani. And uh, when I'm in district speaking, I typically say that uh, the length of your speech is inversely proportional to your height. Uh, but I'll refrain from that today. <laughs> uh, today, the Republican majority stands in front of you with a bundle of wins on behalf of the American people prior to the August recess, based upon our commitment to America. Let me just elucidate a couple of them. One. We had to pass a bill to rein in the D.C. City Council on their soft on crime policies. And no one has spoken about that, but crime remains an issue in every city in the United States. As the daughter of an enlisted man, eight children, my mother also worked, my dad picked up extra work on the weekends, that 5.2% raise to our military is monumental. And it doesn't even keep pace with inflation. 
We will provide full year funding for fiscal year 2024 funding for veterans health care programs, veterans benefits, and VA programs, including electronic health care modernization initiative. Noting that this is an increase of more than 16 billion over FY23 enacted levels. And I'm proud to say that this will also fully fund health care and toxic exposure needs for FY 2024. As a veteran, I am proud of that, but I am still so embarrassed that as of last night, the VA website still said that Republicans were going to not fully fund health care. Secretary McDonough, please take that down and apologize to me as a veteran and every veteran and to the Republicans. I'm personally proud that this Republican House has worked so hard to protect the integrity of women's sports by passing the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. We followed the science, knowing that there is a difference in muscle mass, muscle length, cardiac volume, and lung volume. I want to thank our leadership, Speaker McCarthy, Leader Scalise, Whip Emmer, and Chairwoman Stefanik, in upholding their commitment to America and protecting women and girls as they look to opportunities to compete fairly in sports on a level playing field. I look forward to returning to Iowa and highlighting these wins, but there is certainly more work to be done. Thank you, and I now turn it back over to Speaker McCarthy. Thank you. With that, let's open up for some questions. Yes, sir. Your first question seems like a Monday question. We're going to do it the same way we've done it every single week. We bring all the members together, we talk, bills go through committees, and what we find is the voices from every district has a say. Think about how successful we've been. You've asked me that same question almost every single week, and we've proven every single week how we'll do it, and we'll do it just like we did it this week. Uh, I did not see any Democrats. There could have been some there, but it was a big room, and uh, I was sitting in the front. So, you know, it, we, we showed um, Sound of Freedom. I Look, I'm not saying people buy, but I think every single person should see this, see this movie. I don't want to put any politics into it, but this is about human trafficking. I will tell you at the beginning of the movie, and to be able to watch it with Tim Bollard, who the, the movie is about, sitting next to it, this movie was made five years ago, but it sat on the shelf until someone actually got it out. Tim had not watched the movie for three years. He told me he usually will not watch it. When he comes, he'll go and say hi to Lee. It is too emotional. And at the beginning of the movie when I was watching, I was thinking about Elise and her young Sam. It was difficult. There were moments I was emotionally upset. But when you watch and get to the end, and you think today as a policymaker, I would love to make, sit down and watch this with the president. What is transpiring to these young children? The human trafficking that is going on. Let's not put politics around it. Let's put these children first. And what Tim was able to do to quit his job, to go find the money just to be able to see, save some children based upon what he had seen. At the end of the movie, he was emotional. It was all coming back to him. And I could not imagine what he had gone through. He saved children, but he told me the others that he hadn't been able to yet. I know everybody would feel the same way. And I hope there's an opportunity that everybody can see it. Next one. Yes. Oh, we passed the rule. That, 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 that was a Wednesday question. Okay. Okay. I look forward to this one. Okay, let me, let me be really clear. You, you, you try to frame people. I know, but you, you, you just claim conservatives want to see something. I've just watched this house fundamentally different. For the first time in congressional history, we just cut $2.1 trillion. We capped what we're going to spend for the next six years. We were able to get work requirements to move people out of poverty. We were able to stop the IRS agents they were going to hire this year. We gave parents the Bill of Rights. I think everybody here wouldn't be able to do it without being conservative. 
Now we're going to discuss how can we continue to eliminate any waste. So we go line by line. We're going to try to save as much money as possible. Because the one thing you have watched from me from the very beginning, our debt is too high. When the Democrats had taken over and spent all that extra money that created inflation, that harmed every American, they put us on a path that we cannot continue upon. But when we had to deal with the debt ceiling, they only allowed us to deal with 11% of the budget. So any time and any single day, can we eliminate some waste and make government more accountable, more efficient, and more effective? We're going to do it. And if we've got to take a couple extra days to go through, it's not until September 30th. We're going to take that opportunity. Because the sad part about it is there's not one Democrat on the other side that wants to help us. All they want to do is spend more money. What was interesting to me is when we went to the debt ceiling, they couldn't tell me one dollar in waste. Even though we had billions of dollars appropriated from COVID, that COVID was over and not spent. That's not their money. It's the hard-working taxpayers of America. And those are the people we're looking after every single day. So it's not just the Ag Bill. It's any bill that comes to the floor. We are going to look at any place that we can find and save money because we're saving the American hardworking taxpayer their money. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. First, let me tell you, I have no concern. I actually met with Leader McConnell twice yesterday after this incident. I met with him at 3 o'clock. He came in. We have a regular meeting. We talk about the future uh, legislation we have going, appropriations, other what's happening in the Senate. And then later that night, there was an event on Major League Baseball where he gave a speech and I spoke after him. So, no, I have no concern. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had met with uh, Leader Schumer just, just today, just after the vote. I had requested the meeting because, look, he is the leader of the Senate. I'm the leader of the House. I don't want government to shut down. I want to find that we can find common ground. I met with him to talk about all the legislation we have and the legislation he has, has going. I talked about NDAA. They're going to finish it. We have finished ours. Let's put a conference together. We talked about FAA. We finished it. They haven't finished it yet. Could we go to conference? We talked about appropriations. What I would like to see, they have now passed 12 bills in committee, but they don't have one on the floor. We have one off the floor now. If he can move those off the floor as we come back, move. And could we get into conference early before September 30th so we could try to get this done? Leader Schumer had the same commitment that I had. Let's get this work done and let's try to get it done before September 30th. Look, I think it's always, always better to have bills pass off the floor. That's what our goal is to do. Same on their side as well. And that, that's be productive. Yes, ma'am. Well, the great thing, you all say me, right? Did Tom ever leave? Tom has done an amazing job. Steve, Elise, Garrett Graves, and all the members themselves. We, we continue to work and get together. Um, by phone and others and exchanging paper back and forth. And that's how we've been so productive in everything. Look, I said early on, with a five-seat majority, we have to rethink how we do things. It's not do everything and get to the floor and try to solve it. You've got to do it ahead of time. So you watched on the border security, the many you thought we couldn't get done. We paused it and had everybody in the room and talked about differences of opinion and worked those out before we go through. And that's what we'll continue to do here. So we will take this time working in our districts, but at the same time working together and come back and we'll be much more productive and faster even. Yes, ma'am. Look, we, we have always believed on both sides of the aisle, on both when people have different positions, be it pro-life or pro-choice, on the Hyde Amendment. That has been for four decades. That regardless of how you feel on this position, you shouldn't use taxpayer money for it. When the Democrats took all the majority, for some reason they wiped away 40 years of something they've been voting for. 
I've watched videos of President Biden as a, as a senator pounding and defending it, right? I just think we need to be back to that and there's, then there's not a problem. Yes, ma'am. You're pretty excited, yeah. Okay, let, let me first correct you. Were you there when I said that? Okay, then what did I say? Okay, so you're, you're claiming that I said we're going to impeach the president. I floated the idea of impeachment. Okay, so you're wrong. So if you record, go back and watch. I said impeachment inquiry. There is a big difference. And let me explain it because maybe not everybody understands it. What impeachment inquiry does when you vote on the floor, it gives you the apex of power of Congress, okay? And just walk through what? We have two whistleblowers from the IRS claiming the Biden family were treated differently, that David Weiss let the statute of limitations run out. The basic rule of thumb in any case when you're getting the statute of limitations coming up within six months, you get an extension based upon the individuals. They said the Bidens were willing to do that. They should do that now. We have an individual that we now found went to the FBI a number of years ago claiming that they bribed the president and said you couldn't find the money because all the shell companies, it's the 1023. We found that when then Attorney General Barr found it, that he sent it to the Pennsylvania um, Justice and they said there's more to it. When does an attorney out investigate the FBI? We then found that the president, Biden, while running for office, made a couple claims. He first looked the public in the eye and said, I've never spoken to my son about any business dealings. He said, my family has not taken one dime from China. In part of this investigation, we found that when the vice president became vice president, his family created 20 shell companies, kind of like what the 1023 said would happen. We found that 16 of the 17 payments from Romania came to the president while he was vice president. We now found that money did come from China, differently said. We've now found the president has changed what he said, but we have a real question about David Weiss and the attorney general and the other six people in the meeting. It's contradictive based upon what the IRS agents said and asked questions and took notes from the meetings and emailed everybody about those notes. Now, if you're any member of Congress, this is not saying impeachment. This is not anything but we need to investigate. And what happens, like you watched the situation yesterday where the federal government says there's still an investigation of the Bidens. Well, the only way you'll be able to get information that way is to have the strength to be able to get the documents you need. I was concerned when asked a question that I haven't seen an administration act this way at the same time as Nixon did by withholding information. If, we do not, if they do not provide the information we need, then we would go to an impeachment inquiry. Impeachment inquiry. What simply is an investigation and providing Congress the power to do that investigation. So I'm glad you asked a question that I could clarify that you misinterpreted and misstated. Last question. Mr. Speaker, I mean, considering going through these legislation that passed this 11 locations, I mean, do you think pursuing it would be a good use of your time? Let's see. How productive have we been so far? I can, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. And the one thing I will tell you is, if the administration does not provide the inf information, so you would want us to ignore all the information that's provided? You wouldn't want to know the basis or the answer? Or would you want to keep the dogs barking? I think, I think we could do it all. Hey, thank you. If I don't see you before we get back, I want you to know one thing. I will look forward to your questions on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of doubting us. But more importantly, I look forward to your questions on Thursday and Friday, knowing that we passed it, but asking about the next week as well. Take care. <laughs>